This is an absolutely unbelievable performance from Ed Miliband here. This is exactly what the Labour Party needs. I move the amendment uh, for a windfall tax, standing in the name of my honourable and right honourable friends. According to a report from the Food Foundation... It's really important to watch Debonair in this clip. She plays a pivotal role throughout. Um, you can see her frantically look up stats as he is giving way during the speech. Um, and it all becomes apparent why. Watch this. Half of those on universal credit. This is not just about families out of work, but families in work too. This is a social emergency. Now, the Chancellor wants us to believe that his measures in response are the best we can do, but they are not, not by a long shot. In February, another chance he had, as the largest energy price rise in our history, 52%, was announced. He could have responded commensurate with the crisis. But what was, he says he did, well, let's, go, let's, let's look at it. What was his grand offer to the country? A hundred, 150 pounds council tax discount based on outdated property values, which misses out hundreds of thousands of the poorest families. And of course, I will in a moment, and of course, his 200 pound buy now, pay later loan scheme. A loan scheme, a loan scheme, Madam Deputy Speaker, which he risibly claims isn't a loan, although it has to be paid back, and a scheme that doesn't even come into October. Madam Deputy Speaker, what are families supposed to do in the meantime while they wait for his loan? It's almost like the Chancellor is so out of touch that he doesn't realise that 10 million families in our country have no savings at all. I'll give way to the Honourable. And you can see she's got the data ready for him there. Giving way. The £150 that was given out by Newcastle under Lyme Council was greatly received on the doorsteps, as was the money given out by Westminster Council. Perhaps he should speak to his council leaders in Barrow, Hindburn, South Derbyshire, Bassett North, all councils that failed to get that £150 out of the people's bank accounts. If he's so concerned about the cost of living, why are his council leaders holding that money in their bank accounts yeah. instead of returning it to the people? Participates a later part of my speech. That is the Conservative Party today. They'll blame anyone else and they'll never take responsibility. And, and this, Madam Deputy Speaker, he should have been supporting our measures because in his constituency, 11,353 people would get our combination of a VAT cut and the warm homes discount of £600. And if he votes against us tonight, he'll have to explain to them why he is denying them the help they need. Way. He's making a powerful speech. I wonder if he shares my anger at news this week that the government has underspent its net zero budget by a staggering quarter of a billion pounds at exactly the same time when our constituents are struggling to keep their homes warm and to deal with, with accelerating fuel poverty. I've been around politics for a long time, as this House knows, but I cannot remember, and nobody in this House can remember, the kind of emergency that we are facing uh, at the moment. Now, his recent spring, spring statement, Madam Deputy Speaker, was the most recent chance for the Chancellor to redeem himself, days before the April energy price rise came into effect. M Madam Deputy Speaker, it was apparent to everyone across this House and in the country that what he had offered was woefully inadequate. People were literally pleading with him to do more on energy bills, but he just doubled down on his failure. Three chances in the last seven months, none of them equal to the emergency. And, and, I, and I, I will in a moment. And at every step of the way, the truth about this Chancellor is that he has been in denial, he has been slow to act, and he has been wholly out of touch in his response. I give way to the Honourable Lady. And there you can see, like I said, Dangham Debonair with the stats ready to pass to Ed Miliband. National living wage, in terms of universal credit, and in terms of the national insurance threshold changes, I add up to more than what he is suggesting. No, I don't accept that, and I can tell her there are 8,014 families in her constituency that would benefit from the changes that we are suggesting if she votes for them tonight. Now, let me tell her and the House, Ma Madam Deputy, because this is very important, what this failure means in reality. The basic level of universal credit this year for a single person over 25 is £334 a month. His measures this April are so feeble that someone on that benefit will be expected to find as much as £50 more a month or more to simply cover the increase in their energy bills. That's leaving aside the soaring costs 
of food and other goods. It's about 15% of their income. So what are they going to do? They won't be able to afford to pay their bills. They will get deeply into debt and they will go without food. It's already happening to millions. I met someone in, a CAB, in the CAB in my constituency on Friday in similar circumstances. Let, let me be honest, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would have no idea how I would cope in these circumstances. Would any member of this House? Maybe the Chancellor can tell us what somebody in these circumstances is supposed to do. And Mr Speaker, if you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Madam Deputy Speaker, if you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer and you can't answer that question, it should tell you something, that you are failing in your duty to the people of this country who most need your help. And of course, and of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, what makes him even more culpable is that there is something that could help staring him right in the face, where the case has become unanswerable, where the government has run out of excuses, where oil and gas producers are making billions, a windfall tax. Now, he's... It's so hard to keep track of what the government's position is on this, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I've given up. But he, I, think he said, I think he said he's prepared to look at it. But, but honestly, the British people can't afford to wait for him and his dithering anymore or his hopeless excuses. And I want to go through the hopeless excuses because this is an important argument that this House and this country needs to have. What, what are their excuses for not doing a windfall tax? Right, first, they said in January that oil and gas companies were, and I quote, struggling, in the words of the Education Secretary, struggling. struggling. BP, the highest profits for a decade. Shell, its highest profits ever. The boss of Bernard Looney describing the pipe price hike as a cash machine. Yeah. And these people say the companies are struggling. Maybe we can do a show of hands. If anyone opposite still believes that the companies are struggling, yeah. are they struggling? Yeah. What's their next excuse? They argue a windfall tax would hurt investment. But the pro oh, it will, he says. Oh, he will, says it from a sedentary position. Right, OK, here we go. But the problem is, the problem is the companies themselves say this is nonsense. BP's CEO, who I take as more of an authority as the, than the honourable gentleman, Bernard Looney, was asked two weeks ago which investments he wouldn't proceed with if a windfall tax was lobbied, was levied. And what was his answer? There are none we wouldn't do. Even BP don't buy the Tory arguments against a windfall tax on BP. And the final excuse, and the final excuse, no, I'm going to make some progress. The final excuse, and I, want, I do want to come to this because this is important, and maybe I'm anticipating the Chancellor. The final excuse is it's somehow anti business to levy a windfall tax. Let's dispose of this argument too. And I strongly recommend to honourable members. Uh, who believe this, to read an article which I have here, and I'm happy to put a copy in the Library of the House, and it's by Mr Erwin Steltzer, long-time confidant of Rupert Murdoch. This is the first time I have quoted him uh, in this House, Madam Deputy Speaker. In an article entitled, a few days ago, Now is the time for a windfall profits tax, he wrote this. People who believe in capitalism believe that private sector companies should be rewarded for taking risks not be rewarded for happening to be around when some disruption drives up prices producing windfalls. And that is the point. These profits are unearned, unexpected, and the British people are paying for this windfall. These, these, companies, these companies are not profiting from these companies are not profiting from decisions they have made, risks they have taken, wealth they have created, but from a global spike in prices to which Britain is badly exposed exacerbated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. What is the principle the government is defending here? What is their hill to die on? Is the principle they really wish to defend that oil and gas companies should pocket any profits, however bad the geopolitical instability, that however large the crisis, however gigantic the windfall, taxation must not change? Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a proposition rejected by Margaret Thatcher, Geoffrey Howe, George Osborne, remember him, all of, all of whom levied windfall taxes. And who else do we see supporting a windfall tax today? I have to say it's a pretty big tent, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. John Allen, the guy who runs Tesco, 
Sharon White, the woman who runs John Lewis. Lord Brown, the guy who used to run BP. And Lord Haig, the guy who used to run the Conservative Party. <laughs> the, usual, the usual lefty suspects. <laughs> the truth is, they have run out of excuses. In just the last few days alone, and he, in just the last few days alone, Madam Deputy Speaker, here is the roll call of people the party opposite are trying to frame. I have to say it's hard to keep track. The Bank of England, civil servants working from home, shamefully, the British people being unable to cook properly, apparently the cause of food banks. Yesterday, a ludicrous suggestion for one of these ministers, people not working enough hours. And the Chancellor, and the Chancellor of all people, is at it too. Who does he blame for the massive cut to benefits? He blames the IT system. <laughs> the dude from Silicon Valley. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, who is he trying to kid? If he had got his act together early enough, of course he could have raised benefits properly. Ind indeed, the thing I don't get is this. He found it perfectly possible to cut universal credit by £20 in the middle of the year in September. But I end by saying this. This House can make a difference tonight. And I say to this to his MPs directly. We have all heard from our own constituencies what families are facing. This is an emergency for millions of people. A windfall tax could make a difference. Use, no, I won't. Use this opportunity to tell the Chancellor to... Please remember to like, subscribe... And it's share it if you did like the video, guys. Is it really helps a lot. And if Thanks. they do not, they will have to explain to their constituents why they refuse to support the help that could make a difference now. I urge members to vote for our amendment tonight yep. to help tackle the social emergency our country is facing. Yeah.